So let's just ask God to prepare our hearts. I, I just feel like well, the Bible talks about you know, where there's seeds that fell on hard ground and then there's good ground. And you know, let's just ask God to, to help our hearts be good ground this morning. And Lord, we just ask that you would just prepare our hearts. Holy Spirit, we ask that the, the word that is spoken today is directly from you, that you would breathe life on it. And Lord, that you would prepare us, Lord, to be able to receive today what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, I'm just excited for what God's doing. And thank you, promise. You can go so you don't have to stay there the whole time. But you know, I, I'm just so excited about what God's doing. I, I just know that God is doing something in this church. If you've been here for more than six months, you can see that there's something going on. You know, that, that God, God is moving, and, and there's something fresh that is in this house. And I believe that God is just saying over this church that there's a new season about to begin. That he's calling us into a new season, the deeper levels with him. But it's our choice to be able to step into it. So he's not going to force us to step into it today. And so the last few weeks, I just believe that God's been getting us ready the last couple weeks for this today. For what he wants to do. Now, the last couple weeks we've been talking about the love of God. And, and you've got to know the love of God. You know, because if you don't know the love of God and when he shows up, you're going to be afraid of him. He's a, a powerful, holy God. Awesome. And so we talked about the love of God and how he's just crazy in love with you. You know, the Bible is just so clear that he loves you at your best and he loves you at your worst. You know, it doesn't matter how you're living. He loves you just the same. He doesn't, that doesn't mean he's pleased with how you're living your life, but he's crazy in love with you. And he wants to, to be close with you. And so we talked about how the love of God is like a foundation to a building. I believe you can look at our, 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 of our lives also. You can look at our lives and, and look at it as a house God is wanting to build. And so, you know, the, the foundation of our life is to be built upon the love of God. And so we, we talked about that. Now the next part we're going to be talking about is the, the framework. And so the framework today, we're going to be talking about the fear of God. And so when it comes to the foundation and when it comes to the framework, those are like two of the most important parts of a building to be able to keep a building up. And I just feel like God is saying to some of you that some of you have been a very frustrated in your walk with God. You've been saying, God, where are you at? I know that there's so much more. I read the word of God and I just see something just so different than what I look like I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing at church. And it's because we have not built a, a foundation and a framework that can hold what God wants to do in our lives. And so I, I believe that when God comes into a place, you know, the Bible talks about there's a weightiness to his glory. There, there's a heaviness to when God shows up into a place. And if you don't have a good foundation and a good framework, you're not going to be able to hold it. He's not going to be able to come into your house because he'll, it'll, it'll just crumble. It'll destroy you. I know I'll You'll learn a little bit more about this as we, we go, but I, I'm just totally believing that God is just done with visits. He just doesn't want to visit the church anymore. He wants to dwell with the church. You know, too many times we're going in this place and, and we feel like I'm, I'm about to experience God and, and God's just there, and then all of a sudden it's like, where did God go? One week it's just like, wow, that was such an awesome service, and then the next week it's like it was just so dry and I didn't get anything out of it. You no, know, God is done. He wants to come and dwell. He doesn't want to just come and visit. And I, and I believe that there's a reason for all this that is happening. God isn't just saying, you know, this week I like you, and this week I don't like you, and, and this week you messed up a lot, so I'm not going to come in, and this week you've been a, a good boy or a good girl, and so I'm going to come in. And so I don't believe that's the case. But I believe there is a reason why we see that. You know, because the, the church was just dealing with, was just such an incredible manifestation of God's presence and his glory back in the Bible and Acts. You start to read, and you know, God was moving in such strong ways that in two years' time, all of Asia heard the gospel. Just think about how big Asia is. Everybody, the Bible says, heard about the gospel. It's not because the disciples went to everybody's houses. It's because God was moving so great that everybody was talking about it. You know, that the Bible even talks about how they would go in, some of these disciples, into different cities, and people would just think that they're gods. they say, are, are, are you Zeus? Are you this person or that person? Because they had different gods, just because they had never seen anyone like that that had just so much power and authority. And in the church, we've lost that. 
No, we have a world that's so desperately hungry to know the truth, but they look at Christianity as worthless because there's no power. And so I believe that we've gotten a little further and further and further away. Generation after generation, we've walked away from the way that God has called the church to be. And I believe that today God is calling the church back. Back in the days of Acts, how they lived, he's calling us to be close again with him. You know, there's a, there's a lot of churches that are hungry for God. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of people that are hungry for God. And there's a lot of places still even with that, that God's not moving in their churches. You know, there's just a little bit of God moving, but compared to Acts, it's just nothing in comparison. Why is that? Now, why is it that there is hungry people, but you're not experiencing God that much? I believe it's because we've only prepared a way for the Lord to come in with only a part of who he is. In church, you hear all the time, it, going to the bookstore you, bookstore, you see all these books on the love of God and how he wants to bless you. You know, and, and how you can have favor and how you can walk in miracles and signs and wonders because God wants to pour out his love for people. And no, you cannot take God's love apart from who he is. Because he is love, the Bible says. But we've come to God and we've created him and to be just only loving. And there's another part of God that we're missing now, though. Hebrews 12, 23, or 28 through 29 says this. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Well, the Bible says that we please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. That's something you don't really see in the church. You know, I see a lot of people worshiping with excitement and joy and jumping up and down and you know, hands in their pocket, just standing there and, and watching. I see a lot of all kinds of stuff, but I don't see that many people truly worshiping God with this holy fear and awe. And the Bible says that this is the way that pleases God for us to worship him. And then it continues, the reason why we are to do that is because he is a devouring fire. Well, that's a part of God we don't hear about much. You know, we, we hear about all this good stuff that God wants to give us so much. And you know, what has happened is we've fallen in, in love with the blessings of God and not with the blesser. You know, the church is so in love with the blessings of God. Because how can you not be in love with the blessings of God? It, it, it's great. It's fantastic. God wants us to even like those things. There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is we are not in love with the blesser. We have not made room for the blesser to enter in to our lives and to the church. Because the Bible says he's also like a consuming fire. You know, and fire is really great because fire can bring some really awesome things into our life. If it wasn't for fire, a lot of us would have been frozen over this winter. You know, if it wasn't for fire, you might not be able to cook a lot of your food that you're making. Fire has so many different good qualities that it brings, but also if you don't take it, with a great reverence, it can kill you. It can destroy your house. It can kill others. Fire is not something to play around with. But yet, somehow, the church has been just playing around with God. And I believe that God, in his love for us, is staying at a safe distance from his church. He's, saying, he's staying at a safe distance from your life. You know, we're, we're asking God, God, come closer. You know, and the, because we look at the scriptures that say, if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. And so we're calling out to God, God, come closer, come closer. And if we could just hear his voice, I believe he would be saying, no, you don't want me any closer the way that you're living. If I come any closer the way that you're living, I'll have to destroy you. And I don't want to do that. I want to bring life. I want to bring blessings. I want to bring favor of your life. But the way that you're living, I'll have to bring destruction. Because I'm a holy God. And any unrepentful sin and any love for this world, I will have to destroy somebody that is close to me with that. Well, the church, and for a lot of us, we've created a God 
that fits comfortably in our lives instead of God, uh, us allowing God to mold us into his image. No, and Israel made this mistake. Back in the Bible in Exodus, and, and I, I want to share this story, but before I do, I want to just first to grasp real fast of all that Israel went through before they got to this moment. And so with Israel, they were slaves for about 400 some years in slavery in Egypt. And so God raises up Moses to deliver them. Moses goes to Pharaoh, free my people. Pharaoh says, no way. So God sends 10 plagues. And if you want to know more, you have to read it yourself. But God sends 10 plagues. Finally, Pharaoh says, I need you to go now. You know, if, if you don't go now, God's going to kill me because I just can't handle this anymore. And so they are set free. As they start to go into walking towards the promised land that God has sent them to go to, Pharaoh changes his mind and says, no, I can't let all these slaves go. No, we need to go get them back. Israel thinks they're about to be destroyed. They're scared because they see these chariots coming at them, and they have a water to their backs, but yet God opens up the waters of the Red Sea. And they walk through, not on muddy ground, but the Bible says on dry ground. It was instantly dry for them just to go right through. And Pharaoh, in just his pride and just his ignorance, he's thinking, I'm just going to go through this also with them, and I'm going to go get them still. And yet God closes the waters on them and kills all of the Egyptian army. And then when they're in the, the wilderness here, they have the Bible says that there was a pillar of cloud that they would follow by day. Oh, well, that's pretty cool, knowing that, hey, I'm where, where God wants me to be. It doesn't get much clearer than that. Then God's just saying, hey, just follow this pillar of cloud by day. Not only was that great for them to see where God was wanting them to go, but also it's hot in the desert. I don't know if you've been in a desert before or in a wilderness, but it's super hot. And so it clouded them and it shielded them and protected them. At night when God wanted them to know where he was so that they, they could follow him or they would stay there, is that there was a pillar of fire. So that cloud would turn into fire at night so they could see it. And know the cool thing also is that it could keep them warm at night because it gets really cold in the desert at night. And so when they'd wake up in the morning, there would be different food on the ground. With, it's called manna. You know, the meaning of manna just means what is it? You know, so we're not really sure what it was, but it was from heaven we know, and God just had it all over for them just to go out, pick it up for the day, and they had their food for the day. They didn't even have to go and do anything other than just pick it up right off the ground pretty cool. And then when they wouldn't be able to find water, God would tell Moses, no, just hit that rock right over here, and know oh, the water's going to come gushing out, and then everyone can have water to drink. And so they saw miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They saw crazier things than we've ever seen. And then one day, God tells Moses, I want you to go up this mountain. While Moses is up in this mountain, it's not for years, I'm sure it's for days or weeks, it's it's not that long. The people are like, no, we're just kind of getting a little restless here. You know, God has done a lot of great things for us. And so, you know, the Bible talks about what they do here in Exodus 32.5. And it says this. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. So picture this. Oh, Moses is up there, he's on the mountain talking with God, having a great time. The children of Israel are just restless, just thinking, you know, we want to do something, we're just tired of waiting. And so they have this bright idea in their minds, we're going to make a golden calf to worship. For a lot of us, we've looked at those scriptures before and we're thinking, how in the world do you go from all of that, just seeing God move, going to a place of now you're worshiping an idol? But no, look at this. Back to where I read, it says, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. If you look at the word Lord, and you look at it when it was, it was written in Hebrew. I don't know if you know that, but it wasn't written in English. No, the Bible was written in Hebrew in the Old Testament. And so if you look back and see what the Lord stands for in Hebrew, it stands for Yeshua, or I mean Yahweh, sorry, and Jehovah, which means the name of God. 
There's no other God that has that name. So what they were saying is, no, we want to be able to bring God into a place where we can understand him. A, a place where we're comfortable because this is what we've seen before. Egypt, you know, they used to make gods that were made out of gold too. And, and this was a way that they could show respect to their gods. And so they said, no, we're going to do the same way. And so they made the calf. And they had the best intentions, I believe. They were not trying to make God mad. They just thought, no, this is how we've seen it done before. So no, we're going to just continue to just serve God this way because Moses isn't here to really teach us, and we don't really know that much better. And so here they are about to worship this fake idol that they're calling Jehovah with the best intentions. And no, God tells Moses, no, you need to go now. Tell the people to stop this or I'm going to destroy them. He was so close to destroying them. But here, you gotta, you got to picture and, and put yourself in Israel's spot for a moment. Here they are, and they're just thinking, no, this is what we're used to. No, this is what we're comfortable doing. We've, we've always seen people worship a God this way. We're just doing what we've always seen. The Bible also says that they were drinking a lot, so a lot of them were getting drunk at the same time, and so they were doing stuff. They're just trying to have a party, have fun, worshiping God in their minds. But yet this angered the Lord. No, I just believe that we are a lot more like Israel than we think. Sometimes we can look at them and we can think how stupid they could have been, but what I mean by this is, no, we can create an idol. And we turn Jesus into this buddy Jesus. This is actually what it's called. I bought this buddy Jesus bobblehead. And so we, we turn God into what he truly is, into this buddy Jesus that we can easily fit in our back pocket. You know, and whenever we're going through some hard times or whenever we need him, we bring him out. And we, and we believe that this buddy Jesus is more about making us happy than holy. We think that Jesus is always there. He's my buddy, and he's just there to be able to be my friend, to be able to help me succeed. And, and so we, we have this idea that, and you might find yourself doing this all the time, that you're thinking, you know what, I know I shouldn't do this. No, I, I know it's wrong. I know that, that it might hurt God's feelings, but no, I know that we're buddies, and, and he loves me, and he died for me. And so, you know what, if I just ask for forgiveness afterwards, no, we'll be back to buddy-buddy, and everything will be all right. No, the church has created a buddy Jesus. We've created a Jesus that is more about how us having favor and a bigger house and a nicer car and all this money and living the high life than he is about making us holy. No, we think that, no, Jesus, no, he, he wants me to be happy. And so, you know what, I'm not really happy with my wife or husband. No, so I'm going to get rid of them. No, and, and Jesus will be okay. Because, no, Jesus does not want me to be unhappy. You, you don't understand how miserable that I am. You know, how my wife just nags and nags and nags, or how my husband is just so into himself. You don't understand it. You know, Jesus just wants me to be happy. And so you see a lot of people in the church getting divorced. You know, we go in, into this place also where you see other people, they're sleeping with their boyfriend or girlfriend, and they know that they shouldn't, but they think, no, I'm in love. You know, God knows that my intentions, is, I'm not really trying to hurt God. I, God, I love you so much, but, you know, God, when I get more money, then we'll get married. You know, I, I'm trying to do the right thing right now. He knows that I'm trying, but it's just, it's, it's just impossible for me to do that right now because we just love each other so much. For some of us, it's the place where, you no, know, I'm not tithing right now, but, you no, know, I don't really have that much money. You know, and I'd rather have my kids do this and that. And, you know, my wife likes to go out shopping a lot. And so we get to this place where we begin to just say, you no, know, Jesus, you're my buddy. You understand. You know, one day when I win the lottery, when I get that promotion, you know, then I'm going to just give you this huge bonus and pay you back. And we turn Jesus into this buddy. And we just believe as the church that as long as we believe that he exists, he's somehow there more to serve us than us to serve him. The Bible talks about this, this type of church and this type of Christian. In the end days, the Bible says this would happen. 
And in 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says this. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. The Bible says that it's going to be a religious people in the end days. What does religious mean? Well, a religious person is someone that uses God to get what they want. You know, they're, they're, they're taking God all the time out of their back pocket when they need something. Or maybe they're even that person that's praying all the time, and, and they're up in front of people. They could even be the pastor. No, oh, because they like the fame. They like people saying, oh, pastor, you did just such a good job. You know, we just love you so much. You know, religious people can look different, but their hearts are more about themselves than having a heart for God. And what they're really doing is they're using God to get what they want out of life. And then also the Bible says that there's going to be this generation that takes grace and turns it into the, the big excuse instead of the big empowerment to, be, get, to live a holy, godly life. And we've seen in so many people, and we've done it to ourselves so many times, where the grace just becomes this excuse to be able to live the way that we want to live. You know, that we think, no, I don't have to truly die to myself. I don't truly have to live really this life that's just like Jesus. You know, that's just too hard. And so we begin to make excuse after excuse after excuse. You know, I'm willing to give up some of these things because, you no, know, I can still live pretty comfortably giving that stuff up. But, you know, God, you want me to give up these movies that I love? You want me to give up Netflix? You want me to give up just me doing all this stuff with sports and, and having all this time set aside for the hobbies that I love? God, uh, no, you, you, did, you, have, you, of course, didn't mean that when you said to die to yourself. No, it's sad that the church, especially in America, has been fooled. We've been fooled, and I think it started off by a lot of pastors telling people what they wanted to hear. Because we want to hear about a buddy Jesus. Doesn't a buddy Jesus sound awesome? Oh, everybody wants a buddy Jesus. And so what has happened is you've had pastors that have gone away from God, that have gotten religious, trying to get a crowd, trying to get converts instead of making disciples for Jesus. And Jesus never said he wanted converts. He said, I want disciples. Because I don't even know if converts are even going to make it to heaven. Because the Bible says, a Christian is someone that dies to their self. It doesn't say you can just kind of do whatever you want. You know, just partially give God some of your life and keep some of your life. You know, everybody wants Jesus as their Savior. Everybody wants Him as their Savior, but not many as their Lord. Not many have Him as their Lord. A lot of Christians say, yes, He's my Savior, He's my Lord, and you know, you're only fooling yourself maybe a few other people. But you're not full of God. And I believe that if God is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And that should hit us hard. That should put a little bit of fear into our life right now when we look at our own selves. Oh, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Because the Bible says that we are to die to ourselves. And it's only then when we die to ourselves that Christ comes alive. No, why don't we see God moving? Why don't we see the power of God anymore like we've seen in scriptures before? Because there's not dead people walking. There's all these people that are still alive in themselves. And Christ has told us to die, though, so that he may live in us. To die to this world's ways of doing things. To die to our sins, our selfish ways. Oh, and the Bible even talks about only then truly can Jesus be your friend. Because I'm not saying here that Jesus doesn't want to be your friend, but I'm saying that some of you that think Jesus is your friend, he is not your friend. And I can prove it to you in Scripture. Psalms 25, 14 says this, The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. Proverbs 8, 13 says this, just for us to get a better picture 
of what it means to fear him. And this is not the only definition the Bible tells, but the Bible says this, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Do we hate evil? I, I have a feeling that some of you really hate evil because there's a bondage attached to it. But if there was no bondage attached to it, I think some of you really love evil. I think some of you really love some of the stuff that you're dealing with and the, and the world. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we're like that kid that says, no, I'm sorry, no, forgive me to their parents. And they go back and do it again. No, they're just sorry because they got caught. They're sorry because they got in trouble. No, but are we genuinely, do we hate sin? Do we hate the things of this world because they separate us from a relationship with God? Because they take different parts of our hearts that is really there to be for God. I think a lot of us are just sorry that we got caught and some of us are going to God because we want to get out of the trouble that we're in. When really it's not about getting out of trouble. It's about having a relationship with a God that loves you. God created us for fellowship. He didn't create you just so that he could set you free. Oh, that's just a part of getting us to the place that's really what he wants. How can God be friends with us if we're always offending him all the time? And you might ask, how am I offending God? Oh, well, the average American watches five hours a day of TV. I'm guessing that's probably, some of us are in that boat. Probably a lot of us, if that's the average. That's a lot of TV. And yet, only 19% of Christians, so-called Christians, read their Bible every day. Somehow we have time for all these other things of the world. But we don't have time for the thing that we say we care about the most. No, we can go to different sports games and we can be there for two, three hours, sometimes more, and we're there and we're so excited and we show up extra early because we don't want to miss anything and we're shouting, jumping up and down. But then we come to church and we're coming late. We're dragging ourselves there. We're tired. And after an hour, we're ready to go because we're thinking about food and all the other things we get to do on Sunday. That's offensive to God. No, we, we will go early, and we, we just love these hobbies, and we get so excited about these things, but we, and we think about a lot of our hobbies and the, the things that we love to do all the time, all day long for a lot of us. That might even be all the things that we talk about, but we never think hardly about God and our relationship with Him. We love the world's news. For a lot of us, we'll watch CNN, and, and we'll go on the, the online, and we'll want to we'll look at everything that's going on, but... We don't really have that excitement when it comes to the good news. We'd rather have the world's news by our actions. I just want you to think about this for a moment. If you served at your career the same way you served God, would you be fired? And I'm going to list some things here. I'm, not, I'm sorry I'm hurting you a little bit today. No, but I believe that God wants this to be said today. Not because he wants to hurt you, but because he loves you. And he's drawing us in. He's saying, well, you just come, be with me. But I've got to change some stuff. It might hurt a little bit. No, but if you were showing late all the time like you do to church, would you still have your job at work? If you're always making excuses why you couldn't show up to things like you do with church, would you still have your job at work? If you're doing a halfway job, if you're just sitting there and doing nothing at work, would you still have a job? If you weren't willing to grow yourself and get more education for the things that you're called to do at work, would you still have a job? If you were wanting a raise every time you talk to your boss, that's pretty much all you wanted to talk about, would you still have a job? If you're stealing money from your company, would you still have a job? How do you steal money? Well, the Bible says you rob him by not giving him your tithes and offering he deserves. If you're represented on Facebook and, and you're out and, and about and all over you went and you represented your company in a bad light, would you still have a job? 
Well, I'm telling you today that we will never have God coming in in this place in a, in a mighty way if we're willing to serve man better than God. It's not going to happen. He doesn't care about your words. He doesn't care about your worthless words. The Bible even talks about it that, you know, their words are worthless. Because their hearts are far from me. God is looking for a people that says, no, I'm willing to live the way that you've called me to live. I want to give you my heart, God. I'm just not just talking a bunch of game. And for us, some of us are in that boat. Because I believe that God will not take second place to anything else. He's either going to take first place or he's going to say, you know what, I'm not going to come in. He's either, either going to be Lord and King of Kings over this church, or he'll say, no, no I'll, I'll let the pastor be that person. I'll, I'll, I'll let the elders be that person. No, he will not take second place to anyone. And I just believe if Sarah could help me out, I just believe what this is what God is saying today. Because for a lot of us, we've made this idol, just like Israel has. We've turned God into this person that we want him to be, that's comfortable, that fits in our back pocket, that we can bring out. But God is saying today, I want you to just break all of that idol that you've made. I want you to just to totally shatter everything that has to do with that old way of thinking. Safety first. I just believe that God is just saying for some of us here today, you know, we've had this idol in our life too long. And it's time that God just wants us to smash this. <laughs> oh, God wants us to smash the idols in our life. We might have good intentions. Just like Israel, we might be worshiping God, and we might just do it in a way where we're not meaning to offend God. I don't see anywhere where it says that they meant to offend him. I think they had best intentions. And God is saying today that he wants to draw us back so that he can come in to this place. Oh, he wants us to build him a temple. The Bible says we are the temple of the Lord. He wants us to begin to build him a temple where he can come in now and dwell with us and not just visit. I could have the band. God is calling this church to purify themselves. I believe we're at a turning place right now that God is saying, if you will say yes to what I'm saying, if you will repent, if you will just totally get rid of all the junk of this world that's just holding you back, that has been taking the place of me in your heart, I will come in and bring a new season to your life. I'll bring a new season to this church. But God is waiting on us. He's calling on us to make that first move. Not with our words, but with our actions. I know a lot of you are into Facebook, and so, you know, know how to know your, your status spiritually? The Bible tells us how we can know our status spiritually. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you in John 14, 23 to 24. It says, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. You know, you want to know your status of how you're doing spiritually. It's not based on your intentions. And we become a church that we feel like God is okay because we have a heart for God. God, I've always loved you. Yeah, I know, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I had the best intentions. No, God's saying, no, it's by your actions. It's by your obedience that proves to me if you love me or not. And I just believe that God is just saying, you know, I, I'm looking for people to come back to their first love today. I'm looking for people to begin to empty out all the junk in their heart, all the things of this world. Some of it's sin. Some of it's just all this other stuff that we've just gotten so into. But whatever takes the place of God in your heart needs to go for us to be able to enter into this new season that God has for this church and for our lives. 
No, just like John the Baptist, he said, prepare the way of the Lord. And I just believe that is what God is saying here today to us as a church. If you will prepare the way for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he will come on in. He is longing to come on in, but he will not come into a place that has not prepared a place for him. The Bible says in Leviticus 10.3, Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord said, I will be treated as holy by those who approach me, and before all people I will be honored. God is saying here today, it's time to see me as holy. You've made room for the love, now make room for my holiness in your life. And I just feel like right now, this is the moment. This is your moment to get right with God. This message is not just for those that have come in here today that don't know Christ. This message, I believe, is for every single one of us that is just saying, Lord, I want God. I'm desperate for God to be able to just come on in. I want to see his glory. I just don't want to just talk about it. I don't want to just be someone with good intentions, but I want everything that God has. I want a real relationship with him. I want to be able to see this church walking in signs and wonders and all those things that God wants to bring, just like Acts. I want to make way for the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if you're here today, I believe the way that we are going to make way is by repentance, by getting on our hands, by getting on our faces and saying, God, forgive us. And if that's you today, on the count of three, I just want you to run to the altar. Get on your hands, get on your face, and begin to cry out to God. God, forgive me. God, forgive us for being a church that has offended you time after time and time. We've had good intentions, God, but we just repent. And oh, one, two, three, come if that's you.
What an awesome presence of God that is here today. And we're going to continue this service tomorrow at 7 p.m. We want you all here. And uh, come early, as Pastor Jordan said, you're going to a game. You don't come, you know, to the second half. You don't come in the second quarter. You're there before the game because you're anticipating great things. You're excited about being there. We're stripping off the carpet. We're going to be uh, having the 20 men. Uh, if you guys can immediately help us, we've got ushers coming in. We need the lights back on. Um, we're going to be taking out the chairs, stripping out this carpet. So tomorrow night, you can be here at 7 o'clock or even before 7 o'clock with magic markers. If you have your magic marker, bring it. If not, we have a few dozen. We'll be sharing them. And what we're going to do is we're writing down scriptures. We're believing God. This is not the end. This is just the beginning of something fresh from the Lord. Come on, somebody, put your hands together if you're ready for something fresh from God, something great from God. So if we could uh, just dismiss in prayer, grab a hold of the hand of the person next to you. Father, we just thank you for great things ahead. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the end, it's the beginning. We want to grow in wisdom. We want to grow in the fear of the Lord, and we want to grow in a move of the Holy Spirit. Do something fresh in us, Lord. Let it spring forth, even this spring, Lord. Let it be a spiritual spring, new life, new growth, and, God, uh, new development in your kingdom. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Bring us back together tomorrow at 7. Amen. Amen. We'll see you on Friday as well. Looking forward to it.